a bit. Um, I think we have uh, three of the four speakers. We're just missing Yann Lefranc from uh, from Yospilla, but he's not speaking until a little later on, so we have a little bit of time. Uh, my name is Owen Appleton. Uh, I work for EGI and I'm uh, part of the EOS Cup project. And uh, I'm not quite sure how I was selected for this particular session, but it's definitely a pleasure to, uh, to be involved in it. Um, the idea of this session, before we get going with it, is that uh, <clears throat> the regional projects, the 5P projects, or the ones that are regional, at least this of course expands, which is not regional, um, are an important part of EOSC because they extend it or take it to a deeper level in geographical areas, but they're also intended to bring new elements to EOSC. EOSC Hub, uh, we've been really trying to beta test the day-to-day, -day, perhaps sometimes less exciting core of what EOSC is meant to be. But this is definitely not the limit of the, um, of the, the vision for EOSC. EOSC needs to go much farther. It needs to bring new abilities. It needs to bring new services, new concepts to the research community in Europe. And we definitely see that the regional EOSC projects are a place where we would hope to see a significant amount of of that happening. Oh, I see we have our last uh, co-host here as well, Jan has arrived. Um, so this session is meant to highlight that. We're not here to, to introduce the projects, hopefully you all know them. What we're here to do is to talk a little bit about what they each do, which is different, which others can learn from, and benefit from, perhaps replicate or take up and exploit elsewhere. Uh, so we have the, the regular uh, housekeeping, uh, the event's being recorded. There'll be a link available afterwards. Fantastic, I'm sure you're used to this by now. Uh, don't activate your microphone unless the host gives you permission. That'll be me. Mostly it'll just be the speakers who are talking, I think, at least at first. For questions, please use the Zoom chat. Uh, since I'm sharing the content from others, I'll definitely be able to keep an eye on this quite easily. Uh, hopefully we'll have a reasonable amount of time for questions at the end. Um, please note questions in the chat or keep them until we, we get to the end and then we can try and answer a few. I imagine there will be perhaps time, in fact, after each session for maybe one or two questions if there are clarifications on that particular talk. But I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to speak. So uh, before I go into introducing who the speakers are, will be briefly, uh, one plug I wanted to make, uh, which I was requested to do by some of the 5P projects, uh, in advance or timed to, to come out with this uh, conference. There is a book, Insights from Regional Projects and Infrastructures. Um, it talks about the innovative activities or plans from these projects. There is a link here to it and my slides are already available uh, on the website uh, for, the, for the event. So please do go and have a look at this uh, as well. Uh, I will just quickly say who's going to be talking before I pass over to our speakers. So we have first uh, Ilya Levinson from the uh, University of Tartu from EOS Nordic, who's going to talk about service PIDs. I have to say this is a subject close to my heart because it's something I definitely see the need for. Um, then we will have Mario David from LIP for EOS Synergy talking about, pardon me, <coughs> about basically quality assessment for software and services. This is an interesting topic. Yann Lefranc will talk about uh, social and technical innovations from EOS Pillar. And Judith Eva uh, Fazekas Para, apologies for the pronunciation, will talk about open innovation from Southeast Europe and Nifas. And we'll have some discussion. Okay, uh, I think with that, uh, we're at the end of my introduction. Um, and I will hand over to Ilian. I'll give him uh, control of the screens because I think uh, he has some key things that are easier to show us live. Uh, so, Ilya, uh, please, if you want to, to project your screen. Take it away. Thank you very much. I will actually show uh, slides instead of live, uh, just in case, but uh, generally speaking, if there are questions, I can show live as well. Uh, so uh, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to present uh, the uh, work that we have been doing uh, in EOS Nordic. Uh, this is not a talk about uh, the whole scope of the project. So generally speaking, EOS Nordic is a regional project, which means that we are aiming at implementing uh, whatever EOS is in the uh, specific geographical region. Uh, 
with respect to the uh, motivation for uh, PIDs and why we want to do them, uh, this basically comes from uh, the service package, work package, uh, where we are concentrating on integrating services from the Nordics into the EOSC, as well as making them more interoperable uh, on the, on the side. Now, the PIDs are primarily important for the integration of services. So, uh, we have identified several uh, main goals of uh, why we, in general, want to have PIDs. So, basically, the very first one is that we want a unique key. So, whenever we are publishing, republishing, updating a service and so on, we want to have a way to uh, say whether the service is in or a way to refer to that. So this is the very basic need and I think everybody agrees that this is important. Now, when we already have it, uh, it kind of makes sense to think what else can we get with that. And uh, what we want uh, and what service providers, at least in the North, but I think it's a common problem, generally have an issue with is to how to get attribution for the work that is done. So how do we easily create reports uh, and how do we easily um, figure out who has been actually using uh, the services? So uh, basically, if we're already using PIDs, this can be something that could uh, help to solve this problem as well. And finally, uh, because this is a regional EOSC project, we want to make sure that we will be able to address the upcoming requirements from EOSC uh, from different working groups, from uh, potential uh, funding mechanisms, uh, and make the life easier for the service providers uh, from the project. So, actually, uh, now I want to just show you something, uh, some screenshots of what we have been doing. In order to make it uh, easier, we have decided that uh, we will publish all the services that will be onboarded from the Nordics on a in a separate website uh, under uh, NAIC No Services. So NAIC uh, is a, a Nordic uh, funding body, which is uh, uh, essentially a um, funding agency funded by different uh, Nordic countries, and it uh, sponsors different projects. So inside the Nordic, uh, NAIC is playing the role of the coordinator of the project. Uh, the Nordic services are basically EOSC services uh, with some additional, uh, probably more strict uh, requirements. So uh, we require them to be accessible cross-border. We require them uh, that the service providers actually agrees to have them listed. And we also aim for automation of delivery of the services. So the first step was actually to register the PID for the service list itself. So we have a collection uh, PID that could be used in order to figure out what services uh, belong there. Now for each of the services we basically have a, a way to register them uh, in the um, uh, onboarding platform in a way that would also uh, generate a, a data site PID uh, with required uh, data, uh, metadata and uh, make it uh, available for uh, for the search. It's also is made available for referencing and it's also made available for uh, discovery by the uh, users uh, at large. And that means that uh, basically we are uh, one step uh, closer to uh, getting automatically reports about why uh, a specific uh, service is useful. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, I think everybody agrees that the infrastructure services are generally as useful as the science that they support to do. Uh, now, uh, if we go uh, further and uh, go for a particular PID, so I'm hoping that uh, you're generally familiar with the uh, PID system. So in this case, we're using data site PID, uh, and we have a separate uh, production handle that uh, allows to register uh, services. So uh, this is an example of a service entry that has been generated. Now I must say that the data site selection was done to an extent uh, because uh, University of Tartu is uh, part of the data site so it was quite quite quick to set it up um, and it also had a, well, at least the basic support for the services schema. So this was a first step to to go for that. So as you can see, we have basically a way to 
uh, require or suggest users how to refer to the services in a somewhat standard way. Um, we also did a next step, and that is to provide a common landing view for the sites so that all of the um, URLs that you can get when you resolve uh, the uh, PID, they look generally speaking the same. Uh, and the uh, important aspect is that we try to make it so that uh, this uh, URL would have all the components uh, required for the service to pass the validation, at least the current validation for the EOS portal. So it means that we are generally able to generate the, so to say, lightweight landing sites, which includes all the required information uh, for the offerings uh, that uh, makes the life of the service provider easier. And we also started doing a bit of background analysis. So at the moment, we just collect uh, the referrals, but the plan is to uh, do more and to uh, either integrate some external service or do some basic analysis ourselves to understand as to what, uh, what is the use of uh, more generic services in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in well, publishable results. So this is a kind of a screenshot from the live system that we have. So uh, in a different work package, in the work package four in particular, uh, which deals with the fare and data, we have a uh, activity which is uh, working on the automated assessment of uh, data repositories using a uh, tool developed by uh, Mark Wilkinson. And the way how it works is basically that uh, you provide a, a reference to a digital object, so PID basically, and it runs through a series of tests uh, of different types uh, and tells you basically how fair a particular data object is. So uh, out of fun, we tried to uh, do the same with the services and figured out that we actually are as is uh, relatively high on this uh, fair certification metrics. Now, of course, this is a toy example and uh, a number of tests there do not make a lot of sense uh, for the services. However, as an approach, it actually feels that this would be quite valuable. So if we could uh, indeed do the uh, assessment of services based on uh, automated tests, uh, so this would allow us to improve the maturity of the uh, service offerings, uh, uh, well, I believe quite a lot. Uh, we will be working on that more uh, as the time goes by. For now, we're kind of just starting there. And um, finally, uh, what's next? I mean, uh, this was a bit last minute presentation in the sense that we uh, just started with the using of the PID. So this is in the very early stages uh, of, uh, of that. However, what we want to figure out is uh, we want to understand if we can integrate also data management plans with the services and hence get uh, a somewhat um, live dashboard of expectations of the scientists on services without any additional uh, infrastructure. Uh, we also want to figure out if we can push the accounting data as usage to the PIDs because some of the PID systems do support that. However, the metadata schemas for that is um, well, we're making a stretch to fit it into the service uh, model. Uh, we would also like to push uh, information about how to order services into the PID metadata. Now, this, of course, uh, assumes that there would be a certain standard, but for now, we'll probably start with something quite ad hoc, just to see if we can reach the point where all you need in order to get an EOSC service is its PID. And of course, we want to achieve the dream of the service providers in a sense to remove the requirement to chase the users uh, and get the uh, citations uh, by making that rep those reports automatic. So I think that was it. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, I would be very you, glad to hear. And there are a couple of questions in the chat which we can we can address. One I think I can help with them, and there's one I definitely want to pass over to you. Uh, so Sean said, are you looking up PIDs for services as well as data sets? How do you extend this? How do you deal with if the data is replicated across sites or if the service is federated, does each instance get its own PID? 
I just want to say as a potential customer of this service in a way, this is something that we've been talking about needing for having this connection of different catalogues within EOSC to allow or prevent services being onboarded multiply to different, uh, <clears throat> basically not having the same service onboarded in multiple places. So if something has already been onboarded by EOSC Synergy, we don't want to also onboard it again in exactly the same way for EOSC uh, Pillar. We prefer to just pull the data across. Uh, and I would say if, if there's a service, uh, I would define the service as not just the tech, but the, the actual instance of it as well. So potentially, I guess, different instances could have different PIDs, but I would see that the, the live service would have a single identifier across different places. And as Ilya says, this could be really useful for both funders and providers to understand the use of their services. And certainly for the catalog and portfolio managers, this would be incredibly useful. One question I see from, from Isabel is uh, Isabel Campos. She says, uh, what is the point of using the concept of PIDs when we already have digital certificates to ensure the uniqueness of the services we publish? So, yeah, maybe you can answer this much better. Uh, I must admit that I'm not quite sure what you mean by the digital certificates. I mean, could maybe Isabel, you could elaborate a bit on that. Uh, I see Costas mentioning PIDs are persistent uh, and can be updated to point to different locations if needed through time. So maybe this is a, uh, ah, okay. this is a difference. Uh, uh, Isabel, can I unmute? Let me see if I can. Uh, I will. Yeah, no, I, I was referring to to your first slide when when you were uh, kind of motivating the the use of this unique mm -hmm. publishing and updating services in the OS portal or catalogs. Uh, we have been using digital certificates and. Uh, you know, and all, all the service providers uh, identify identify themselves with that, right? So, uh, uh, sorry, I'm not quite familiar with the concept of digital certificates. Uh, can you uh, elaborate well, a maybe bit? Maybe this is the problem um, of the misunderstanding. Yeah. So, uh, whenever you publish a service, in order to, to authenticate yourself to the user in a mm -hmm. proper way, you have to prove who you are, right? That you are the ser and, and this applies to people, and it applies to to services as well, right? The, uh, mm -hmm. So every service has a unique digital identifier already in terms of its certificate. So what, what you are proposing is uh, is using uh, is using this concept instead of. Uh, so uh, do you mean like a, like a TLS certificate or X five nine certificate or? Yes, this this kind of. Certificate. Ah, okay. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, for sure, every federation has its own uh, concept of unique identity, uh, whether it's. Uh, whether it's um, a reference to the uh, organizational units uh, using uh, uh, some PID system or the uh, ontology in a particular X509 federation. I mean, uh, the point there was that um, uh, the digital certificates, which are X509s, are somewhat more technical ones, and the federation that uh, are typically established there, I mean, the trust there is um, not so much aimed at the uh, uh, distribution of the metadata which is required in order to generate a nice looking uh, website. So we basically uh, uh, took the PID from data side because uh, it's uh, essentially connected with the publications. So we get uh, essentially, I mean, you can get the, you can satisfy the uniqueness with a uh, quite number of uh, ways. However, in order to satisfy also other requirements, uh, you need to be a bit picky about those things. So if you get an X509 certificate, uh, you probably will not be able to generate uh, automatically a website that uh, has, uh, well, lots of useful data, nor would you be able to automatically get the citations uh, if somebody refers to, uh, to you. Okay, can I uh, just, uh, um, sorry, Isabel wants to reply, but uh, Isabel, um, I want to give other people a chance to talk as well. Is it something brief or uh, is this a lengthier discussion? Okay, let, let this bell answer, then we'll let Costa say something and then probably we'll have to move on to the next presentation. Yes, my, uh, I wanted to add, you know, as uh, Ilya said also, the, you know, the um, certificates are not persistent and they might change and they, they affect a number of different things. While persistent identifiers, which is PA, what is PID stand for, are there to cover exactly that persistence and unique identifiers that are universal throughout the world. And it's easy to transport uh, and to copy paste in every form. That, that's one part of the question. The, the other part is that 
we are talking about the service description itself. We're not talking about the service instance which has a specific uh, certificate, uh, X509 certificate, right? It's completely different. A service, the a service description will not have one unique uh, um, certificate for that. You may have a PID if you want, but the website will have one certificate for the whole website, which may include zillions of services. True. Right, and yeah. assigning assigning to a set to us to an let's say entry in a website that this is the certificate for that entry is a bit uh, a time consuming, um, expensive, and uh, you know, expensive to maintain. So while a PAD is a lot simpler, you have you by using an API, you can issue a PAD assigned to the service and maintain that throughout time easily with updates. If the location of the service or the or the, or the service description changes, because you want to update the web server or you decided that you need to add one more category in the path, that can be updated easily. And this is why the persistent identifiers make sense. Okay, I'm going to let Isabel have a very brief comment, then I'll wrap up and I want to go on to the next presentation. But there's some interesting stuff in the chat as well. Isabel, did you want to say something briefly? Uh, I wanted to ask if this is then only made for the purpose of acknowledging the usage or cross-referencing? Not or... just, also identifying, uh, having an identifier that <clears throat> spans across different portals or different registries so that, like I said, you don't end up duplicating the onboarding and updating of services. Um, this is another real usage. And just to answer, I'm not going to go into everything, but on to one other point that was um, coming out of the uh, out of the chat about who, who owns this. For me, if we have a service PID, we don't have to call it a PID if we bother Sean, but if we have some unique identifier that's persistent for services, I think this is a schema that whoever fulfills it should in the end be owned or mandated by the EOS legal entity, because the point is that it shouldn't just be down to one particular place. It should span all of the arms of the OSC. It's just my view anyway. Uh, for now, I think we should move on because uh, that was an interesting presentation and prompted some interesting discussion. Uh, if I could just a uh, couple of last words. Uh, I see that the yeah. comment from Sean is that uh, he's not uh, happy with the approach. Sean, I would be very happy if you could just write me some uh, points in uh, chat, not to take more time, uh, just to figure out why. Thank you. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm interested in perspectives because this is something I see the need for from the onboarding side. Okay, I, I'd like to move on now uh, because I think that was a really good presentation, uh, but I want to give all of the regional projects a chance to talk. Uh, I know these stretch on otherwise. So the next speaker is uh, Mario David from LIP. Uh, Mario, do you want to just take control of the screen? Uh, yes, I'll try. <laughs> if not, I'll uh, uh, give it to you. I'll uh, try to share the screen. Give it a go. If not, I have your presentation, I believe. Uh, okay, you can see? Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay, good. Go ahead. So this is uh, the contribution of uh, EOSC Synergy uh, for this session. We'll concentrate on the quality assurance uh, of things, and we'll uh, get to that later on. Uh, so this is the, the outline, which I will pass uh, uh, briefly and go to the content itself. Uh, this is the project mission, which is to add capabilities by leveraging uh, national uh, digital infrastructures. Uh, this is the consortium of more than 20 partners from uh, eight uh, uh, countries. And uh, we'll get now uh, to the actual uh, quality uh, for software and service. So we start on uh, the top uh, right, uh, which is uh, software quality assurance. Uh, uh, and I'll go through this, uh, this uh, circle um, uh, as we uh, go uh, on this, on this hold uh, to have a higher quality of service to be integrated in, in EOS. The next is quality uh, service quality assurance. Uh, then these, uh, the first two are um, the first two are, uh, uh, let's say, uh, kind of abstract uh, criteria that we do not, uh, um, sorry, that we do not uh, make any uh, say on the implementation because the implementation 
uh, that we are uh, working, have been working, is uh, through CI CD pipelines, through DevOps approach, uh, and Jenkins, and we'll go to that also later. Uh, we plan to have, and we are working on a, an SQA as a service. This is a pipeline composer on demand. Uh, if uh, either the software or the service has passed the criteria, then we will issue badges. And these, we hope that it will lead to a higher quality of services to be integrated in, in, uh, in EOSC. Uh, this is the same slide, but with uh, actual uh, links. So the software quality assurance, we have a, a, a link to digital CC where it is published as open access. Uh, we'll have that as well for the service quality assurance. Um, the, again, the Jenkins libraries and, and pipelines, they are already being applied uh, to quite a lot of uh, software components, uh, even from the Indigo Times. Uh, and uh, in EOSC Synergy, we are developing this SQA as a service. There is a white paper, which is linked here for the badges, uh, where we uh, assess several technologies. So, uh, in particular, uh, these are links, for example, for the Jenkins library and example of Jenkins file, as well as the uh, service that we are uh, hosting uh, for the badges in uh, the OSC Synergy uh, framework. The software quality assurance has been published quite a long time. We are uh, supporting and evolving uh, the criteria. It is currently at, at, uh, at version 3.2. So we have the links, uh, we, it's open, and we accept contributions. You have the guidelines, and the document itself and the documents themselves are treated as code. So the issues are, uh, the doc is managed in, in a GitHub repository, a public uh, GitHub repository, it's treated as code. This discussion goes through uh, issues. I mean, if you want to contribute or if you want to uh, make comments, uh, you go through issues. You can also um, uh, make changes to the document or that things, and this will go through pull requests and discussion of these changes. The document, when it is approved, the pull request is approved, is auto-built. That means that the PDF, HTML uh, are uh, auto-built for a given document. The criteria is designed toward uh, div um, automation and the DevOps uh, approach. And you have here as well all the, the projects that have been contributing and using uh, this uh, document uh, baseline and uh, now EOS Synergy is, is doing uh, this. Uh, here um, I go briefly through the plans for the 4.0 um, version. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, uh, go quickly through, through this. Basically we want to uh, add uh, topics about software release maintenance and support as well as appendices uh, that um, appendices that have the actual implementation and uh, actual technology and services that we use for uh, several uh, software components. Before we go to a service, we have to contextualize what the service is. A service, as conceived in EOS Synergy, represents the following three uh, items. A web service, and this is described here, uh, a web application, and a platform or a service composition, which is an aggregation of multiple small services into a larger uh, service. It can be an integrated set of web service, web applications, and software components. So examples of these are web portals, scientific portals, gateways, uh, data services and repositories and the, them and the thematic service, for example. Okay, so when we talk now about services, we are talking about these three in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in conjunction or in, uh, in separate. This is to end uh, 
So the service quality assurance, uh, we are working on the document as, as we speak uh, for, for this. It follows a DevOps pragmatic approach, uh, builds on the outcomes of the, and the experience from the software quality assurance baseline. In fact, there are points or criteria that are uh, common uh, to, to both or are similar, let's say. Uh, service put in place processes and tools to define and automatically validate uh, software and service quality and maturity. Uh, and we will be applying this uh, to the thematic uh, and eventually generic services of uh, EOSC Synergy. Also, data. Uh, we are working on automation, uh, automated verification of fair data principles. Uh, and the, for this, we have uh, been having uh, collaboration and, and meetings with First Fair and CESDA, for example, uh, the results and outcomes uh, from these uh, projects. After, again, the documents, we try to have uh, this document, the criteria description as abstract as possible, uh, so that uh, the, the developers or the operations or whatever can implement, let's say, uh, the, the criteria with whatever service they, they want. In particular, uh, we use several things. I mean, we use GitHub for uh, um, for the for the for the code, uh, for the issues, for example, pull requests. We use unit tests for the software, and um, we use Jenkins and Jenkins pipelines uh, for uh, to automate uh, several types of, of tests that uh, map into the criteria. So the service quality extends uh, the Jenkins uh, pipeline, goes a, se a step uh, beyond the software quality. Um, we also work on automated deployment. So this is also part both of the criteria and then of the pipeline. In the end, if uh, everything is well, then we issue uh, badges. So these are uh, the steps. The SQA as a service is a way to make on-demand composition uh, of Jenkins pipelines. And this is uh, actual development that we are doing right now in uh, EOS Synergy. And uh, you have two uh, moments where uh, badges can be issued. On uh, the quality and the software quality criteria validation and on the service instance uh, validation. So these are the two points, let's say, in the pipeline that you can, uh, let's say, have badges to issue uh, for the quality that has been verified. So uh, this is working in progress. I don't know if I have much time, but uh, so this uh, will have, let's say, a service where uh, people can enter, compose their pipelines, uh, it makes use of a, a Jenkins library developed by us. Uh, yeah, this is working process. The badges um, contain uh, metadata inside and the metadata uh, states uh, the passing of the criteria through the Jenkins pipelines. That means the verification of the criteria um, that that the, either the software or the service has passed. Um, so we have published uh, um, we have published a white paper on the state of the art of badges technology, and we have uh, chosen Badger uh, platform uh, to uh, to operate and to issue the badges. And this is in operation in this, in this link under the Ask Synergy uh, framework. So this is just, uh, let's say, uh, snapshots of the badges service. And now uh, probably the ultimate, uh, what we want to do uh, and test with are uh, the thematic search. So we have 10 thematic services, which are, which are here. 
Um, so this will go through um, uh, dealing with different types of codes and repositories, testing, unit testing, uh, code style and security checks. Uh, and in at instantiation, we have things like uh, um, authentication and authorization, integration with authentication and authorization. Uh, we have things about testing the service itself, uh, monitoring, uh, and yes, we have one criteria which says uh, the service to have a, a PID, although this is just one of many things that uh, we require for the quality of the service. The pioneer, we choose one, let's say, pioneer uh, use case, which is Warsica, uh, let's say, to test all uh, this, uh, this machinery and the Jenkins uh, pipelines, pipeline. Um, so this is being uh, worked on. So Warsica was one of the uh, use cases or uh, thematic service, which is for coastline, waterland, uh, uh, simulation of coastline, waterland uh, uh, interface. Um, it's based on uh, uh, Copernicus data. Um, so it has been chosen as software and service quality assurance implementation. Uh, it is composed of several uh, services. So this is a platform. Uh, we have a, a web portal, a processing engine, several microservices, uh, and has to be integrated with both computing and uh, data repository. So uh, one does not go without the other, for sure. And most of the use, the services are like that. Uh, this is a status of uh, the work being done with, uh, with Warsica, which I will pass. Uh, and I would like to make um, some uh, final remarks. So the final remarks are uh, uh, hold what uh, of, of the previous uh, windmill. The software QA has been published, is handled as you, you, you can contribute, as I, as I said. Uh, it is in, a, in, a, in a, an open uh, data repository uh, in digital CSIC. The service quit, uh, QA uh, quality assurance baseline is, is work in progress, although it already lives uh, in GitHub, but it is in a, in a draft, very draft mode. The, the SQA implementation with CI, uh, CD pipelines, the software quality assurance implementation, this type of uh, criteria has been uh, uh, implemented since the times uh, it was originated in the Indigo Data Cloud um, project, and it continues. Uh, several components and software uh, over several projects follow these, uh, these rules, let's say, these criteria. The SQA as a service uh, composer for pipelines is under development. Uh, the badges white paper has been uh, published and the service is, is, is operational. Of course, all of these will go uh, to the thematic services and in particular now we have uh, the WordSeeker, let's say we are concentrated on the WordSeeker uh, 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 thematic service, although all the other thematic services are in different stage of work regarding the SQA criteria and implementation. So, I mean, it's not, we are concentrating on Warsica, but all the other thematic services are already, of course, implementing uh, parts of this, uh, of this criteria at their own pace. And uh, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Mario. That was interesting. Um, you were pretty much to time. That was great. So we have time for a couple of questions or comments. Uh, I'm just pulling some things out of the chat. Uh, Tony Wildish says not every service is web or orientated, e.g. databases. Um, Gavin Fox points out SQA docs should also be machine readable. Uh, I'm going to open this to, to comments for people in a second, but one point I wanted to make from my point of view is I'm very interested in service quality, and I think what you've done with service quality is interesting. But I do think we have to be slightly careful that we don't see this as the whole picture of service quality. But what you're talking about building on the software quality, which is a very valid approach, for me feels like service technical quality. 
this isn't quite the same as the full range of quality measures if we think about the management, the availability, things like this. Um, so I think we need to see this in the, in, the, in the context of perhaps some other measures as well, rather than the only measure, but I think the, the measures you're making are really, really interesting. Um, I, I wanted to make a comment on, on this. Uh, the first of all, first of all, is that the criteria is very on, oriented to a pragmatic DevOps and automate, and it can be verified in an automated way. Uh, so this is one thing. Uh, of course, uh, this will be a first application that we want to introduce, and this will be applied uh, in EOS Synergy for sure for the thematic services and and, and others. Uh, and of course, um, I mean, we are, uh, this is why it, it's an open, these are open documents, is that you can go, you can uh, check, and you can uh, contribute, and we can uh, discuss. Uh, but again, this is, a, a, let's say, a first uh, way, let's say, on a pragmatic, automated, uh, as possible way uh towards quality yeah I, I agree and i think this is an interesting move forward as well if we look at validation of services within the osc one of the things we know is that mechanisms re which require everything to be checked by hand won't work so we need to automate and make machine readable everything we can and then probably leave the things we can't for for human testing i think this is very analogous to to fair certification as well um I know this is something I've discussed with Hilke Kurz, for instance, from SURF, who's very involved in this. The, 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 the automated testing, which in fact Ilya presented earlier on briefly, tangentially, on the fairness of data sets or data, data sources, uh, is really good, but doesn't always tell the whole story. But it reduces the workload enough that you can do the extra bit, uh, perhaps, manually. So I think that's an interesting uh, question. Just a, a small comment on, on Tony. Uh, for example, if you have a public API, you can test that public API, for example, of the service. And you can have, I mean, and we have seen from Costas the monitoring that you can do uh, functional testing, uh, which is just not pinging uh, the service and port. You can really do functional tests. So, <coughs> sorry. If you have a public API exposing the service, uh, we can indeed do this type of, of thing. Okay, I think uh, I'd probably like to move on, although I do notice there was quite a lot of support, including from me, of the idea of using the open badges. I like that. It's something I've seen elsewhere, and I think it's quite effective, and it's quite a smart choice for the, for the, the area we're in. If we have time at the end, we can return to some other questions. Okay. However, for now, I would like to, to move on to the next talk, if that's okay, which is uh, from Yann Lefranc from EOS Pillar. He's at uh, Chines in, uh, in France. Uh, Jan, are you happy to take over projecting your screen? Sure. Right. Excellent. Go ahead, Jan. Yep. Hi. So, hello, everyone. So, I'm Jan Lefranc. I'm working with uh, CNES as a technical manager for the project EOS Pillar. Um, there's my email, so if you have any questions, you can also drop me a line and uh, I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Um, so today I will try to present an overview of the innovations we do in Pillar, and we chose to actually uh, look into two different aspects of EOSC that we consider important, uh, social and technical. So a short slide for summarizing uh, Pillar, I won't go through it, uh, you certainly have seen it already but I will make the slide available. So in any case, if you don't know Pillar, that's a good way to find information. So within the project, our vision is that if we want to build a European open science cloud, and we know that it's shared by everyone, we need to consider the two aspects of the cloud, which, is, which are the social aspect, considering governance, policies, and, and how you, and the different national initiatives in many of the states uh, interact, so legal aspect and so on, and the technical aspects, which, is, which are more related to how to connect uh, uh, services and resources together so you can work with them. And um, these uh, two different aspects are strongly grounded on practical cases based on the various needs from the scientific communities, but also the national initiatives and member states. Um, okay, why can't I? Okay, great. Um, so 
in, in the both, we are working on the both case, social and technical. So this presentation is going to be focused on, on several aspects that we are working on that we think are innovative on the, the two different sides of social in, innovation and technical innovation. So one was the National Initiative Survey uh, that was performed at the beginning of the project. And I will talk a little bit about, about that and design a lean framework for, in, for national initiatives to easily integrate EOSC. And the second part would be on technical innovation and we have several. So I will mostly focus on one that I think is quite interesting and important. And we hope that uh, uh, you will gain also your interest and you will, we will be happy to, to have your contribution as well and your uh, input is to build a, what we call the federated fair data space to actually support scientific communities involved in the project, which is actually nine different communities to actually create a unique space where you can access data from, from, from these different communities. Um, there are several others that I might not have the time to talk about, but I'll be happy to, 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 to uh, talk about it if you have any questions. We're also building a detailed catalogs of national infrastructure services using uh, uh, EOSC service description templates. Uh, we're also uh, building links uh, to, to between the infrastructure services and this uh, federated data space and we have some use case driven uh, uh, innovation and i have two slides on that and if i cannot go through you can go through the slide and contact us if needed so in terms of social innovation um the first things that that we think was quite an innovation is that we started to look at um what is the current status uh, at the regional level at least the countries involved in the project uh, for the different research infrastructure on organization, technic technical aspects, and legal aspects for data management. So for that, we actually uh, used a um, standardized method for uh, uh, building survey and doing the analysis, and we came up with a representative online survey, uh, and we uh, gathered uh, inputs from uh, multiple of the stakeholders. And this, actually, this questionnaire and the uh, code source was actually released open source. And it's been reused partly by, by uh, the other original projects. Um, what was uh, innovative is that we started to really look into uh, an ex extensive list of all the organizations that could be addressed in the, in the regional countries. Um, and we uh, actually classified them into four groups, uh, e-infrastructure, research infrastructure, universities, and funding bodies. Um, and this, this work allowed us to actually look of course, at stakeholder groups that are big and already involved in EOSC, but also to include now uh, in the analysis, the small and regional initiatives. And we actually asked them questions about four different topics, business model, SLA and user support, uh, access policies, uh, AI and licensing, data management and fairness, and user community and service. Um, all of this data has been mined and uh, the data set is made available uh, together with the analysis uh, on the uh, Australian Social data Science Data Archive. And you have the DOI in the slides if you're interested. Um, the other innovation we are working on, and this is work in progress, uh, actually uh, my colleague Federica talked about, about it during the previous session on national initiatives. The idea is to build a lean framework for national initiatives, uh, to look at the constraints and opportunities for them to, to hook up with uh, uh, EOSC and actually to work together and things on cost analysis and business models, uh, legal and licensing aspects. And also one thing that's uh, uh, interesting is to actually look at indicators to evaluate the EOSC readiness uh, for, for these national initiatives. I won't go further. Um, oh, okay. Use the arrow. So now to the technical innovation. So the, the second part of the project is actually focused on, on, on technical part. And the initial idea of the EOS pillar project is to actually have an infrastructure architecture where we have on one side a federated data space, a federated fair data space, and a federated infrastructure of services um, that would be accessible and registered in national service registries and directly available for on-demand processing and cloud computing services. Um, this architecture is enriched by the fact that we have nine different use cases covering a broad range of, 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 of uh, domains, uh, which allow us to actually uh, build up and identify needs from these communities 
and add to these different uh, um, uh, building blocks uh, the needs of the community, such as data provenance, vocabulary and ontology management services, catalogs and, meta and metadata standards. Uh, on the federated data space, there was the need expressed by a community to actually link data with open, open access uh, publication. And on the infrastructure service, there are, there are needs, several needs like virtual analysis platform, VREs, archiving, and of course, compute services. Our approach is to actually harvest this, these requirements from, from the communities and then look also at the existing EOSC service that could be available through the EOSC portal um, on storage and preservation, data management, sharing and discovery, compute and processes analysis. So this is to give you a, 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 the broader overview in the context. Now, I'm going to focus mostly on the federating and uh, federated fair data space. And the idea here is to we say, okay, we have many different communities and some of them have actually collaboration and might need to actually access data from one and the other. Um, so the idea is to create, to federate and, 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 and this data repository and in the process to try to verify them. So make them uh, as fair as possible, right? So um, our approach is to actually uh, consider this federated data space as a, uh, uh, um, a layered approach where we have the data repositories um, and that will be interconnected through an interoperability layer that will include connectors for each of the APIs uh, that will allow us to har harvest the metadata uh, from these uh, different repositories and then to start looking at how to convert and enrich these metadata so that they would be fair compliant and, um, and then published in either a fair data point or and or uh, a, a fair digital object repositories. This federated data space has two sides then. Uh, one is for repository owner and we're building a process and an interface for actually the repositories from the different communities to register their repositories and start doing the, the conversion of the metadata, the enrichment and then the publication of the fair data point. Um, and there is the, the side of the user where we want to connect uh, 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 infrastructure services such as D4Science for data analytics as a VRE, uh, Galaxy services for uh, 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 analysis workflow or any community specific service and even provide a federated data space search interface so that if you want to go and look at what kind of data can be available there, you can already do that uh, on a single front end. To build this uh, 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 federated fair data space, um, our idea was to, to say, okay, we need to go fair. So let's align these repositories to the fair principles through the integration of the specification, the current specification on the fair digital object and the fair data point. Um, and we are uh, working now on the first implementation. So this is work in progress. Um, so please be gentle on the, on the comments and um, uh, do not hesitate to give us feedback, but the idea is to actually rely on existing tools and not reinvent the wheel. So we are currently uh, deploying a, uh, an instance of a Cordra um, that was developed for as a, a fair digital object uh, repository. We are also deploying a fair data point service developed within the context of GoFair, a verifier service that we are going to certainly extend at some point, but that's there, it's developed by LUMC. And for the metadata harvester, uh, we are going to investigate the smart harvester proof of concept that was developed in UDAT and the VRE therefore science for uh, some of these uh, uh, um, components to actually uh, um, uh, work with the data. Okay. Um, now, I don't know if I have time. I've been very quick. So, um, this is one of the innovation that's coming out from one of the use cases that I actually showed in the general uh, context picture. Uh, this is work we're doing with the social science uh, community. Basically, their request was to try to build a, a bridge between Nakala, which is a, a French uh, social science repository with HAL, which is a French open access publication repository, uh, which actually propose a dedicated view for social science publication only. And the objective there is to link the data set stored in Nakala together with the corresponding publication stored in AL and to allow user to go from one to another and vice versa so that they can actually directly 
see what are the metadata data sets associated with the publication, and if they go through Nakala for searching the data set, they can automatically retrieve the associated publication. Um, so we're doing a current uh, proof of concept implementation where we use one of the EOSCOP service, a V2 node, as a service to build a linked data compliant links uh, between the data sets and the publication. And the second one that we are working on is also um, a secure Galaxy environment for sensitive data. Uh, the global idea is to actually have this uh, um, uh, ser compute service available to work with personal health data um, and, and to, to work basically on a secure environment and avoid having to uh, upload the data and, and, and extract the data. Um, and to connect that service to the federated fair data space. So it's built on existing services that we have already in the, our catalog of uh, infrastructure services. Uh, um, and, and basically the idea is to do uh, close to the data computing. So I know it's slightly different from the previous presentation where is, which were uh, hyper-focused, but we are trying to build this, um, this federated data space and all these pieces all, all together are going to contribute to the usefulness of this um, uh, federated data space. And now, if you have any questions, please shoot. <laughs> Thanks, Jan. That was interesting. And I appreciate what you said about it's slightly different to the other, the last two um, uh, talks, but at the same time, I think you still really focused on the results, uh, which is really what I think we wanted to do with this session, so I appreciate it. Yeah, and I wanted to be exhaustive, to be fair with my colleagues. We're doing a lot of stuff, and I think sure. there might be a lot of interest from different projects and different perspectives. So it was hard to choose one. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I still think it's good, and hopefully, I don't know what others think. We can mention this at the end. I think this validates the idea for this session that we don't do, you know, project descriptions. We do showcases of the things which others are going to find interesting. I think this is one of the values of, of conferences like this. And maybe brings us more close to a scientific conference than sometimes the what are essentially massively oversized project meetings can become. Mm. There are a couple of questions uh, that I want to pull out from the chat. Uh, we've got a few couple of minutes. Uh, the first was from Isabel, who, Isabel, you're always very reliable on asking questions, and I appreciate it. What are the federation tools you want to use for the federated data space? Given two repositories, how do you federate them? Which middleware layer? <sighs> Um, so the middleware layer is actually this uh, um, that we are testing is this uh, uh, EU that proof of concept or we call the smart harvester. Um, this is based on the idea to use the open API specification. So to create an open API description of each of the uh, APIs of this repository and to have a centralized service for storing them, uh, accessing them and to use them for um, uh, querying automatically the, the APIs of this. Um, so I can see that. So this is, this is what we're trying now. So this is the, the first prof, uh, proof of concept implementation. So if you have any suggestions for any other technologies, please. Great. Uh, we also had a question from Chris Atherton and Jayant. Have you thought about using a rule-based system such as iRODS as a way of creating a federation tool? Yes, Arrod would be um, yes, Arrod would be a good candidate to create such a federated uh, uh, federation tool. However, um, our aim here is to actually um, to ease the burden on the repository owner, right? So we don't want the repository the repository owner to have to change too many things because they don't necessarily have the resources to do that, and to 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 make it uh, uh, really practical to to. Um, to, to actually integrate things. So that's why we would like to create this, uh, um, I would say, uh, uh, common descriptions of the API. So it makes things easier. That's the only thing that they have to do. And just make sure that they maintain this uh, API description so that we can get the uh, uh, late, latest version of the API so we can make the proper query. Yeah. Thanks. And there's one, one last one that just came in for you, Jan from Ferath Kerif. Uh, is it a federation of the metadata or federation of the underlying data? Um, so, yes, that's a very good question. Um, in the end, it's a federation of the metadata. But as, this, um, as the technology we're using is the fair data point, which relies on DCAT to 
uh, uh, standard. Basically, uh, through that, you can get direct access to the data uh, within the repository, right? So the, the URL to get access to the data within the repository itself. So actually firing up the, the record in the data set is already there. So the federation is more at the metadata level, I agree with you. Um, so that's, I think, all the questions we had in the chat. Uh, I see some thanks from the last two people you've answered as well, so clearly your answers were appreciated. Uh, is there any last comments before we move on to our last speaker? I want to give uh, everyone a chance to, to talk. No? Okay, in that case, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and we'll, we'll move on to the, to the last talk. So the last talk is from uh, Judith Eva Fazek Aspara from uh, NIFOS Europe. And I have to apologize, I had missed off the Europe when I meant, when I was listing NIFOS in the past. Uh, I had to say, I knew about NIFOS, but I hadn't clocked the, the full name, so my apologies for that. Judith, are you happy to present from your screen? Yes, I do that. Fantastic, it's most straightforward. Great, so the floor is yours. Okay, so can you see my screen? Uh, we see your presenter view, so you might want to switch. Oh, cool, yep, just a sec. Okay, now, Perfect. now it should be, okay. So I'm uh, the representative of, uh, of, uh, of Nefos Europe project. And uh, I would like to uh, talk about how NIFAS Europe promotes and supports EOSC and open science innovation in Southeast Europe. Um, our project main goal is to build a local, national and regional capacities by supporting uh, the development and inclusion of open science initiatives in the 15 partner countries. Uh, by facilitating the adoption of FAIR principles through trainings, by providing technical and policy support in onboarding the existing and future service providers into EOSC. Within the landscaping survey, the question was held on how familiar are you with EOSC? It has been found out that 60% of our stakeholders in the partner countries are either not very familiar or unfamiliar with EOSC. So we have a lot ahead of us to train the different uh, stakeholder groups uh, on EOSC and open science innovations. Out of the 534 respondents, 90% said that training is either needed or much needed. Our goal is aligning with their intention. Out uh, of the survey results, an online stakeholder map has been created, which shows the existing uh, open science stakeholders in Southeast Europe. They have been identified. Um, <clears throat> by um, <clears throat> uh, by their roles uh, of open science functions, uh, we uh, have um, identified funding, creating, supporting, consuming, and facilitating open science functions. This map is uh, the result of our landscaping uh, activity. Uh, it offers insights uh, on the local capacities and needs to provide input for the whole range of NIFOS Europe activities. Um, and uh, we contribute together with the InfraEOSC 5B project to the final mapping of the whole European landscape. As you can see, uh, this map supports uh, filtering. Um, you can filter to country and stakeholder group. Mm, you can, uh, there is a zoom in functionality. It enables users to find the precise location uh, of a stakeholder. Each stakeholder is marked with a pin and a tool uh, tip showing the organization's name and link to its website. The data sets, which includes information about uh, 1010 stakeholders deposited in Zenodo under a free license. Aligning with the results uh, of the survey, we designed our training platform to serve the needs of our trainees and trainers. We are using an integrated Moodle and Big Blue Button environment with AI login. This uh, 
uh, represents a single location where all training materials is going to be gathered and provided to the trainees. Anyone interested in a particular topic should be able to, uh, uh, to find it easily uh, with the um, available resources. Each training event organized will use the platform as a repository for all training materials. The training platform uh, will provide access to online self-paced uh, courses, including training materials shared by other related projects. The platform supports various roles. It's GDPR compliant. You can choose out of the different course categories and uh, create on the fly users if needed. It's a user-friendly environment with uh, simplified course uh, discovery based on tags. Um, as I mentioned, Big Blue Button is, uh, integ uh, is uh, the integrated webinar system. It gives us the opportunity to have an interactive virtual train uh, to have interactive virtual trainings with its slide sharing option, live whiteboard possibility, built-in polling system, and the session recordings. The training plan. Uh, is aligning with the results of our survey. We are trying to train the different stakeholders in the partner countries on their needs. We have already finished three out of the five train the trainers events. We planned 15 capacity building training events, which will be built upon the train the trainer events and expand the training with additional topics, which are relevant for the national service providers. For the national end users, we uh, plan 17 training events. Uh, here, the goals are twofold. Uh, one hand, uh, these training needs to increase the familiarity with FAIR and EOSC, building upon the train the trainer event and combining the specific topics identified in the landscaping survey analysis. On the other hand, these trainings will also focus on the use of the onboarding services, adopted the set of services that are of interest on the national level. We have uh, EOSC promoters in all the partner countries. They will be science communicators and bring EOSC closer to the scientific uh, and all different stakeholder communities. They need to know the infrastructures and services of EOSC and the open science initiatives within their region. It is expected that all the EOSC promoters are people who have visibility at national level and are able to engage the community, acting like ambassadors for EOSC and FAIR. Further training of uh, the promoters might be needed. For this purpose, all the EOSC promoters uh, would be participating in the train the trainer events of NIFOS Europe. The EOSC promoters would receive additional trainings in topics such as FAIR, national EOSC promotion, ORDM, and onboarding of services. Relevant services uh, onboarding is one of our major role and supports the long tail of science. Our onboarding experts created a methodology, what I uh, will now show it to you. Uh, within NIFOS Europe project for the proposal stage, we have organized regional services in a hierarchical structure based on their functions and relationship. At the first level of this hierarchy, we have grouped service from the pre-production environment, such as monitoring help desk AI, accounting, so on. At the second level, we grouped common services that provide generic capabilities and address technical needs that are common to various research areas, such that they can be used by multiple thematic uh, services. The services from this level of the hierarchy supports different aspects of the data life cycle from creation to processing, ana analyzing, preserving, accessing, and reusing. Thematic services at the third level are research community specific services that provide uh, value to the researchers. In this category, we have uh, grouped highly cross-disciplinary services that typically provide access to the community specific data resources through the software layer that unifies tools for various an uh, analysis, comparison, visualization, study, and all other numerous aspects of post-processing. At the highest level of the hierarchy, we have grouped uh, various uh, 
literature and data repositories that hold uh, and preserve scientific information. At the lowest level, we have a resource catalog or portfolio system that implements a resource description template and contains information about all project resources. In general, resources onboarding includes five main steps. Uh, first, a uh, request is sent by the service provider via email or submitted via a dedicated form uh, that officially initiates the onboarding process. Second, relevant information is gathered using a service description template or a corresponding online form, which could be incorporated in the service catalog uh, or portfolio system. Third, resources integrated with the existing EOSC tools and federated core, such that it is compliant with the defined rules of participation. Four, a service is validated by tools from the federated core. And five, a service is published in the EOSC catalog. Uh, during uh, the first uh, six months of the project, uh, our, we have developed a methodology based on which a plan for resource providers onboarding to the EOSC was created. The figure summarizes uh, different aspects of uh, a resource description that will be gathered by the NIFOS Europe service portfolio system. Some of them are non-EOSC related aspects uh, of the resource, uh, resource description, such as general research, uh, resource descriptions and technical specifications of the resources. While more interesting for us were EOSC related aspects that drove the NIFOS Europe onboarding timeline production. In particular technology readiness level, the TRL, EOS integration level, EIL, and management integration level, uh, MIL. Aspects of the resource uh, which, uh, <clears throat> which will be equally considered during the onboarding process. Uh, we use the technology readiness uh, level, TRL, to assess a research development stage. And the figure illustrates nine different stages uh, that TRL oversees in the process of development. From the onboarding perspective, only high TRLs are of interest. However, in our portfolio system, we will also collect and describe resources that are currently under development. We strongly believe that EOS could influence the course of the development, and therefore we would like to be able to track the progress of a particular resource and inform the de developers about EOS. EOSC features and functionalities that could be integrated and reused in the early resource developmental stage. Inspired by the TRLs to be able to measure the EOSC integration levels, we have put on the same equal footing various levels of integration that could be achieved. We have tried to organize gradually these levels based mainly on integration complexity and the necessity of particular integrations. The figure illustrates NIFOS Europe EOSC integration level, EILs, to be accomplished by a resource. The level of integration uh, presented here might not be interest of particular resources in the case when uh, direct benefits from integration is not apparent. In such cases, we consider that the resource accomplished a particular level of integration and it will be able to proceed with higher level integration. The resource, uh, resource management integration level, MIL, uh, pro um, procedures and policies will ensure the practical implementation of various roles and participations. Technically, although resource management reflects the achieved level of integration with DEOSC, it imposes uh, some concrete obligations on the resource uh, providers related to the resource maintenance and operations, and therefore it is considered independently. Using the same approach as for the TRL and EIL categorization, we have introduced nine different levels that uh, the resource could reach in the, in the integration with the project's resource management procedures and policies. We have tried to align the management integration levels with the EOSC integration levels by identification of tools relevant uh, for the performance measurement. 
Also, we have identified cumulative levels of integration with EOSC. Uh, that uh, a resource can reach during the integration with the EOSC low, medium and high. Here we lay out the previously introduced uh, TRL, EIL and MIL categorizations onto this more descriptive classification. The, par uh, the primary proposal for this is to identify a minimal integration level that a resource has to reach to be exposed through the NIFAS Europe catalog, as well as minimal integration level that the resource has to reach to be distinguished as an EOSC resource. So, uh, <clears throat> these conditions illustrate uh, in the figure should not be considered as a static set of rules. Uh, they reflect the current EOS development uh, stage and will evolve through time following this EOSC expansion. We believe that EOS core resources that provides the means to discover, share, access and reuse data and resource have to evolve dynamically with the EOSC exchange layer, which holds on uh, all onboarded resources. To um, uh, evangelize national open science initiatives, trainings, uh, onboarding and EOSC we planned 30 national country level dissemination events and one uh, great regional event. During these events, we will have the opportunity to talk to various stakeholders and serve their needs in the changing scholarly communication ecosystem. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Judith. That was interesting. Um, interesting in the uh, also had quite a different focus to the to the other talks. Uh, you you definitely still weren't doing the project introduction, which I'm incredibly grateful for. But uh, quite a different focus on where the innovation is, which I think is really good to show that the innovation doesn't always have to be a tool or a technical system. I think the integration in terms of um, <clears throat> uh, should we say a greater focus on training in the communities that you're serving is a is a really uh, different way forward. Uh, there's a few comments uh, in the chat, which maybe I can get you to answer. Uh, Sean DeWitt asked, and I'm pretty sure he was talking about the training because that's when he asked the question, are these only available to your communities? Are they advertised in the portal? So these are your training uh, options. Um, can you repeat the question, sorry? He asked uh, if your training is um, only available to your communities within NIFOS, I guess he's asking. Uh, actually, at the moment, uh, yes, yes. At the moment, uh, our trainings are uh, for just the community, but we uh, are considering some trainings to be uh, freely available. I think that could be you interesting, know, especially yep. if they're open, if they're on Moodle yes, or something. Yes. Yeah, that's good. Uh, then Ignacio Blanquer asked, are EOS promoters focused on EOSC evangelization or interfacing with the scientific communities to guide their adoption of EOSC services and principles? I believe the latter could boost more uptake of EOSC in the, near, in, the uh, in the user communities. So he's asking, are your promoters focusing on just saying EOSC is great or going specifically no, no, no. to scientific No, they are, no, 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 they, uh, they are not just focusing saying that EOSC is great, but uh, they are trying to, uh, like, uh, EOSC promoters are mostly uh, high-level people. So they have, uh, like, the access for uh, the ministry people and the funding uh, bodies. So they can go there and, uh, like, uh, tell the vision of uh, EOSC for the high level um, decision makers, I would say. Okay, interesting. So that's, that's the idea in that case. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then there's a question from Mario saying, I think this is when you were talking about the uh, TRLs. Does this mean that a service at TRL 1 belongs to minimal integration in EOSC? So uh, he's asking, I guess, is TRL1 still being part of EOSC or not? Costas, raised hand, can we uh, yes. like, uh, Sorry, unmute? Can I, uh, can I unmute him? Uh, uh, I can unmute him, it's fine. Oh, you thank go. you. There you go, Costas. Uh, yeah. Um, well, yes and no. They, uh, there are two different, uh, three different categories how we classify uh, pro both providers and resources or services. It doesn't mean that they are on par. Uh, the uh, maturity integration level and the, or the marginal integration level and the uh, 
else integration levels they are based as a uh, say uh, as a pattern to, towards the TRL but doesn't mean that the TRL one equals TRL else uh, integration level one there is no um, let's say um, direct connection between them it it sometimes happens but other times you know you may have a um, else integration level of one but TRL nine for example an HPC system we never have uh, achieve high level of integration with the USC. It will only be part, but on its own will be a TRL nine or ten. So you shouldn't be comparing those. There are different criteria to just to evaluate what are the resources available. Yeah. Um, so uh, Mario was asking, uh, can you show the slide? He said it was the penultimate slide because I think that's what people are referring to. It might help the discussion. Uh, it might have just been a misunderstanding based on that. Um, uh, Anastas also wanted to say something. Yes, I wanted to add actually to 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 Costas fully agree with what he said. Uh, I mean, we there was there has been a lot of discussion on the quality and the necessity of the services and on the data sets. Uh, in all previous events, people say that you might have even very low quality data that is very useful. For example, the same should go with the service. Sometimes they some services might not be on a very high. TRL, although we do like to have them in a, in a higher TRL, but sometimes some communities find something that is maybe not that high on the TRL scale, but find it very useful. So that's why we will not use exclusively TRL, that the idea that was shown on the slides and on the, the NIFOS onboarding process is that, that um, it, we use this composite like metrics uh, for, for the services and would like to see it from different aspects. Yes. High TRL is important, means that something is tried and tested, etc. But NETS should not be the only and the only eliminatory and the only inclusion factor. All things should be considered. That's why we go to these complex metrics, provide different aspects, and then combine these different aspects, both the integration level, the technical readiness, the EOSC readiness, etc. So when this combined, we will have the, the, the better, better view of, 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 a, of a specific service to be onboarded. Yeah, I think that's an interesting way of putting it, that no one measure is sufficient to show usefulness to EOSC. Yeah. Of course. Uh, there's also a question here saying from, from Chris Atherton, I may have missed it, but who asserts the different levels for the providers? Um, I'm just, I will let uh, people from NIFOS answer that, but I do also want to mention here something which is actually something I wanted to bring out of some other sessions as well. TRL, while an interesting measure, is problematic in that what we've been given from the Commission is essentially a single line definition for each TRL level. And it doesn't offer up something which has uh, a large list of criteria uh, that show that you have met each TRL. And I have had a very large set of discussions about, for instance, which TRL level is beta, because beta is also understood to be different by different people. Um, I think one thing that we may have to do as a community, and maybe we can do this through some of the uh, interest groups or you know, the collaboration platforms we have, is among the projects that are on boarding services and other resources, come to some agreement mutually on uh, what criteria we can add to each TRL, but not just descriptive criteria, but validatable criteria, because this is actually quite a problem. We can say something is tested, but what does that mean? Are we going to go to the provider site and see their testing plans? Often we're never going to have the time for this. Uh, there's also a comment from uh, Isabel, did we agree at some point that TRL 7 uh, or above is what we go for? And just a comment on that right now for EOSC Hub, we only accept services to be listed in the EOSC portal if they are TRL 7 or above, although we only offer them to be orderable if they're TRL 8 or above. So we accommodate some slightly lower TRL services to be listed, but we don't go to the same level of integration. There's nothing against TRL 1 services, but perhaps they are not ones that we're exposing quite so widely. Uh, I did want to give a chance to um, uh, the people from NIFOS to answer the question though about who asserts the level uh, on these different scales of the service. Costas, is that with how you wanted to, to mention? I can unmute you again. I can answer that both and also the uh, about the TRL question. So let's go first of all with, uh, with Isabel. 
the idea was that we we proposed this um, management integration level and ELSC integration levels, even though TRL may not be that high, so that we can entice and cultivate the uh, the services or curate the services to to achieve the minimum levels required, i.e., TRL level or integration levels higher. That's one part of the equation. Now, when it comes to who uh, qualifies this, is that uh, NIFOS has already created a, a strong team that it, it does exactly that. A, um, validate the services against this, those criteria we have. B, curate and enhance and support the service providers in order to achieve higher levels. Our, our aim is exactly that, to make sure, sure that the, the services are EOSC ready or mature enough or strong enough mm -hmm. to be onboarded and be provided to, to EOSC. I think this is very interesting because maybe it's a difference between EOSC Hub and the regional projects, that there is a greater emphasis for the regional and the cluster projects to incubate new services as they come up through the TRL, to TRL levels before they hit the level where we're perhaps going to expose them so widely outside. But again, I do find it interesting having these multiple measures because I think well, uh, multidimensionality is important here. If you operate in a region or, or a smaller scale than EOSC or EOSC hub, then it's easier for you to focus nationally and provide these. As Judith mentioned in, the, in her presentations, our one of the main goals of NIFOS Europe is to build exactly that, the um, EOS, national EOS initiative or national EOS, let's say, uh, organizations or providers. You, you can do that by A, building consensus in a political level so that there is one EOS, let's say, initiative per country. B, by cultivating, curating say, services to become uh, EOS ready or EOS valuable. This may be, a, for example, you may have a high TRL service, but they have no access policy. They have no um, uh, help desk that can operate independently of the, the rest of the organization. You need to be able to be able to, to allow this flexibility in order to open, for, for example, to, to EOS customers. Yeah. I think that's able a good point. Um, so we only have a couple of minutes left, but on the other hand, I think hopefully we're drawing to the end of the discussion about uh, about this topic. Um, before we, we stop, because uh, I do, do want to stop on time so everyone can get a lunch break, and also some of us have long sessions doing training in the afternoon, uh, I wanted to ask if there are any other last general questions about the session or any other burning questions people want to, to raise about one of the talks, which we probably can't discuss now, but at least to start the conversation from that, perhaps in the offline discussion. Is there anything else anyone would like to say? Uh, please uh, raise your hand if there's anyone, anything anyone wants to raise. Okay, so there was something from Anastas, but that's directed to Mario, so I'll let that probably happen offline. Okay, uh, in that case, I'll try and wrap up. Uh, I don't have any slides for this because uh, this, this session is also a little bit of an experiment, but for me, I think a successful one. I hope this is a kind of session that we can run again, because I think it is nice to have an opportunity to show each other the new and unusual stuff that we're doing. Um, and yeah, like I say, avoid describing our projects, focus on showing our innovations and our successes and the things that could be taken up by other people. And I did see in this session quite a few people mentioning that they were interested in the work of other projects and they might investigate or try and maybe take up uh, their solutions. If that happens, that would be, for me, a big success and also part of showing what is the case for EOS, which is that we can learn from each other, that we can share each other's work, that we don't have to replicate everything in every area. We can let things be built in different areas and still all benefit from it. So hopefully I will see you all in a session on this topic again the next time we have an event, perhaps in person, <laughs> perhaps virtually, depending on how things go. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I think we can stop here and I'd like to thank all of the speakers and everyone that asked and answered questions as well. This was certainly one of the one of the more interesting sessions for me so far, so far this week. Okay, thanks everyone. Goodbye, have a good lunch, see you in the afternoon. Bye, Owen, thanks. Bye.